most of all grateful to so many of you turning up uh, after all the paper lectures and uh, long weekends on top of that that we've gone through. So, but it's worth our coming, and I'm very pleased to introduce to you uh, Remia Pelsrum, who comes to us to us for the, from the Royal Dutch Institute uh, at Rome, uh, probably to talk about Roman things. Um, where uh, Jeremia has been uh, based in Rome since uh, 2012, where he's the uh, archaeologist who represents the archaeological section of the uh, Royal Dutch Institute over there. In 2012, so before going to Rome, he also completed his PhD, which he uh, uh, took at uh, Leiden University in the Netherlands, where he worked under uh, an ancient historian, who many of you will know, Luc de Ligt. And under his supervision, Jeremia wrote the dissertation Colonial Landscapes, Demography, Settlement Organization, and Impact of Colonies Founded by Rome. Uh, during those years, he was, the years he was working on his PhD, he also taught uh, part time, so, so to some extent part time, working on his PhD, teaching part time at the University of Nijmegen and uh, Amsterdam, Free University of Amsterdam, at the Latvian University before that, which took his undergraduate degree. And uh, pleased to see the uh, makeup of the audience here because a consistent feature of Jeremia's research has been emphasis on archaeology and on ancient history, really sort of taking those two strands and uh, integrate them uh, as much as you can. And sort of I think the, the turn up here is uh, really doing justice to uh, that element. And that combination of archaeology and ancient history is sort of yeah, his supervisor, Luc de Ligt, uh, but also from the title of his dissertation that mentions demography and settlement organization. And these are sort of two terms. One, the, the latter settlement organization is precisely the sort of term that an archaeologist would tend to use, whereas demography is more the sort of thing that an ancient historian foregrounds. And it's precisely a feature of the Eremias research that these two things uh, come together. These trends also come together in a book that recently uh, appeared that he edited with Tessa Steck, Roman Republican Colonization, New Perspectives from Archaeology and Ancient History, where indeed the same uh, elements come to the fore again. Uh, let me just mention uh, two field projects, as an archaeologist, also there's two field projects and based at the Dutch Institute of Rome. Uh, Jeremia is involved in two field projects. One is landscapes of early Roman colonization uh, that he works on with uh, Tessa Steck, who's based in Leiden. Uh, and they're looking at non-urban settlement organization under the Roman Republic, so you can see the connection. Uh, what to talk about, and I'm sure we will see various views from those uh, southern Italian landscapes that uh, he works on. In fact, so you here have worked on as well. Um, he's also involved in the project of mapping the Via Appia with uh, Stefan Moles from the University of Nijmegen, uh, where they're um, intensively mapping the multitude, the, so the overabundance of monuments from all sorts of periods that are to be found around, under, and well, perhaps over uh, parts of the Via Appia. Um, and finally, I should mention that the whole reason uh, Jeremia is here and has been over the past weekend, that together with uh, Ian, uh, he's one of the co editors uh, of the journal, Archaeological Journal, uh, Archaeological Dialogues, who are having their editorial meeting here uh, over the weekend. Um, after all those archaeological discussions, well, so the, the discussion here is going to continue with a very specific focus on settlement evolution and Roman rule in mid Republican Italy. Let's welcome Jeremia. Thank you, Peter. And thank you for the Jakowski Institute for having me here and for the warm hospitality I have received uh, thus far. far. Um, today I want to start with this perhaps rather unexpected image of the colonial settlement of Savannah, Georgia, founded in 1733, because I think it captures very nicely a particular societal ideology which also dominates our thinking about Roman colonization and its relationship to the successful Roman imperial strategy. The main message uh, this image articulates, at least I think, is the extreme rigid difference between, on the one hand, the colonial settlement in the center, and on the other hand, the land surrounding it. And note, for example, that there is no transition zone between the two landscape elements. And the frontier here is absolute. The dichotomy evoked in this image is clearly one of culture versus nature. It's interesting to see that nature in this context is depicted as this intimidating and above all 
unused landscape. Yeah? While the main two and intertwined characteristics of the colonial settlement are absolutely the opposite, uh, geometric order and equality. What is interesting also is that this endless, dangerous and above all, uh, uh, this endless and above empty forest clearly asks to be cultivated, uh, which in a way legitimizes the colonization of this area. N nature here clearly needs to be conquered. Note especially how the central axis of the town continues into infinity into the woods, a symbol of the future expansion of the town and consequential cultivation of nature. How much of this uh, image reflects the actual situation might be questioned, uh, but it is perhaps interesting to know that many of the first generation colonists apparently died after uh, a couple of year years of diseases and lack of clean water. And the few that survived did so because neighboring Indians helped them. So clearly the emptiness of the woodlands suggested here is somewhat misleading. On this cadastral map, we can see that the rigid, orthogonal and egalitarian layout of the town continued in the territory. Uh, every colonist received, besides a small lot in the city, also a parcel in the hinterland to cultivate. A Negro labor was prohibited, not so much because of the moral implications, but because it would turn the colonists lazy. Uh, the colonists were ex-prisoners uh, from Britain. And we can clearly recognize in this plan the influence of, at that time, contemporary societal theories, such as voiced by Montesquieu. And to the mindset of the enlightened scholar, equal partition of land was associated with societal progress, uh, of which imperial success was considered a natural consequence. Uh, societies that divided their lands fairly among peers were not only considered superior from a moral point of view, they were also assumed to be more powerful. And the line of reasoning is perhaps too complex to discuss today in detail, but essentially the idea is that fair division of available resources promotes civic commitment, which results in more motivated citizens and thus more successful soldiers. Equally divided landscape were expected to reproduce and reinforce military, reinforce military values of equality, comradeship, self-sacrifice and austerity. Uh, they, they can be seen as the fundamental expression of uh, the Republican motto, uh, to, to place the needs of the community above personal interest. Uh, everyone is equal and serve, serves the collective. The, or the origin of the paradigm which associates imperial success and societal, uh, with the concept of the egalitarian peasant soldier society can be traced back at least to classical Greece and was also crucial to Roman societal philosophy where it operates mainly in decline narratives. Despite the fact that the roots of this intellectual tradition go back to antiquity, uh, the, the implementation of these views in society at large and in colonial practices has arguably been less successful than this long intellectual history might suggest and in most cases has remained a utopian fantasy. And this can be demonstrated nicely again with the example of Savannah, Georgia. The utopian society that was envisaged, envisaged quickly abandoned its ideological founding principle as it did not answer to the harshness of social and physical reality. Uh, the colony from the start was an economic failure. Uh, the rural organization based on the principle of equality was a fiasco. The inexperienced colonial farmers could hardly make a living and complained constantly about the division of land in equally sized plots. Uh, some plots in the orthogonal grid were located in terrains unsuitable for farming, such as swamps or too far from good water resources. And farmers wanted to decide for themselves where and how much land they could cultivate. Also, the prohibition on Negro la slave labor was considered unfair, as it made their prices uncompetitive in regard to other nearby colonies. The utopian colony only survived a decade or so because Oglethorpe, the founder of the colony, uh, and the other trustees continued to invest money in it. Uh, only after the colony lost its semi-independent semi status, 
and was transformed into a regular plantation colony, it started to prosper and became the agreeable town it is today. This example, if anything, illustrate, illustrates that the vitality and success of egalitarian landscape should not be taken for granted. And nonetheless, it is this model of, ter of colonial territorial organization which, con which continues to dominate our view on colonial practices in the ancient world. And before I go into that in more, de in more detail, I, will, I want first to show you another colonial settlement from the new, new world which was founded more than a century before Senna, Georgia. And this, of course, is New Amsterdam, founded in the year 1626, uh, by, uh, uh, yeah, uh, 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 two years earlier, 2064, by the Dutch West Indian Company. If we analyze this drawing, uh, we, can we can see clear differences with the Savannah landscape. Uh, first of all, there is no rigid divide between the colony and the surrounding landscape. And on the contrary, colonial settlement fluidly and without clear borders is situated in a rather friendly looking landscape. There is a fort in the middle around which haphazardly are situated clusters of houses which organically adapt to the natural landscape. And we can even see a friendly Indian canoe in the front. Uh, this landscape clearly com communicates a, a different colonial message. If we now turn to a map of uh, the same colony drawn a decade later, we can see that this blending of colonists, landscape and indigenous people is even stronger than we might have envisioned based on the earlier line drawing. Uh, the map is not very easy uh, to understand, but what we can see is that colonists founded small settlement throughout Manhattan in neighboring areas. I don't know if there's an arrow, but all these small dots are different colonial hamlets and settlements. Now besides the colonial center of New Amsterdam, we see other hamlets such as uh, Fort Oranje and New Harlem, and there are many more uh, located on strategic uh, points. These settlements, most inter interestingly, alternate with Indian settlements. Uh, here depicted as the strange rounded topped hut, resulting in a fas fascinating patchy and organic settlement landscape. Paradoxically, of course, these Indian settlements apparently had regular egalitarian looking layouts. Well, let's now at last uh, turn to the Roman period, and the period I'm, I'm really going to talk about. I show you here a well-known artist impression of a mid-Republican colonial settlement drawn in the 1980s. Uh, the image captures perfectly conventional understanding of Roman colonial practices. It's not difficult to, s to see how close this understanding resembles the Savannah model of colonization. Apart from a few minor differences, there is a, a fortified urban center on the image, it's almost a copy of the former. And the geometrically ordered and equally divided landscape of the colony is sharply separated again from the chaotic, organic character of the uncolonized character, where we, where we can even see a small indigenous village. Terra <coughs> lasciati yeah. agli indigeni is written by it. Um, and the dichotomy evoked here is again one which associates colonial power with cultivation, order, equality, and dispersed but very regular and dense rural settlement. And while the native landscape is portrayed <coughs> as being uncultivated, chaotic, and populated by village dwellers. Put it differently, what we see depicted here are two very different stages of economic and societal organization. And the colony clearly more culturally evolved while the native uh, landscape is closer to nature. To depict a colonial situation in this fashion sends out a powerful message. Uh, it legitimizes and at the same time explains imperialism. The underdeveloped or unused native land clearly desires to be cultivated, uh, to be <coughs> modernized by the colonial power. At the, at the same time, we now understand why the Romans were so successful in conquering people. They clearly are the more advanced people. In other words, 
Conquest is shown as a logical consequence of evolutionary forces and morally justifies as it brings higher forms of civilization to underdeveloped people. The aim of my pap paper today is not so much to dispute that such well-ordered landscape, colonial landscape, ever developed in the Roman world. As there is evidence to support that, at least part of these landscapes were actually realized in some point in Roman history. And uh, this beautiful late Roman depiction of the colony Anxur Terracina surely seems to suggest that, although also this, this image should be analyzed with care. Rather, I want to question the powerful but also very static and monolithic understanding of Roman colonization we often accept, which offers little room for alternative modes more sensitive to geographic, cultural, or perhaps more important to this paper, chronological changes and developments. When we have a look at this map, which rather conservatively indicates the number of Roman colonial foundations in the northwestern part of the Roman Empire alone, one realizes perhaps better the scale of radical but uniform landscape, landscape transformations implied by the embracement of the orthodox colonial model. Uh, this would truly be an astonishing achievement of Roman imperial power. Uh, but do we really envision all these dots colonies which have been founded in more than five centuries of Roman colonial history to have been successful examples of the Savannah Georgia experiment. Uh, don't worry, I'm, I'm not going to review all these colonies and their territorial organization today. In, in this paper I shall focus only on the mid-Republican period and that I define that now as the fourth and third century BC. Now this is the crucial period, of course, of the formation of the Roman imperial strategy and also the period during which Rome transformed from this regional power into the ruler of the Mediterranean world. Focusing on this period thus allows us to analyze how Roman colonial settlement, organization and societal organization at large fit in this Roman imperial success story. In a previous paper, published in 2008, I have already started to question various aspects of this conventional egalitarian model. And I have tried to expose some conceptual biases in previous scholarship. Uh, I argue there, and I, and I quote from myself, uh, if we release ourselves from the idée fix that Latin colonies in their early years were organized according to the city-state model, uh, consisting of an urban center and a rigidly ordered hinterland, it becomes possible to see other forms of settlement organization. Although the evidence, the archaeological evidence is still very flimsy, the information presently available seems to indicate that a multiple core nucleated settlement system was the norm in most mid-Republican colonial landscape. Uh, this claim quickly found support in a study by Tessa Steck, Peter already talked about Tessa, uh, who based on a new reading of the epigraph epigraphical evidence came to a similar conclusion and also suggests that villages had an important role in colonial landscape, landscapes. Well, although this alternative model is attractive, at least this to me of course, as, I, as that was my conclusion of my analysis, there is now a clear need to test the validity of uh, these very various hypotheses in the field, uh, empirically. So to this aim and to enhance our understanding of this crucial moment in Roman and imperial history in general, in 2012, a new large-scale and interdisciplinary research project was started, entitled Landscape of Early Roman Colonization, which is indeed directed by Tessa Steck and myself. The project analyzes in detail two case studies in central southern Italy the Latin colony of Isernia, number one, and the other one is Venusa, Venusia, more to the south, number two on your map. Both were founded in the first half of the third century BC. But both are located in very different geomorpho geomorphological zones. Uh, Isernia is located in the mountainous Apennine landscape, while Venosa, you can see an image uh, here below, is located in a more undulating and flat landscape of the Apulian Plain. 
by comparing the settlement organization and dynamics in these colonized areas with those of neighboring non-colonial lands, which are investigated in exactly the same way, we aim to define what, if any, structural change in rural settlement organization can be attri attributed to the Roman conquest and su subsequent colonization in these areas. One, one of the main objectives of the project is to test if the established paradigm, which sees mid-Republican colonies as these rigidly organized lamp landscapes, and which suppose these colonies founded all over Italy, set off a radical transformation in ancient italic, of the ancient Italic rural landscape. Uh, the, the paradigm, which I try to illustrate uh, with these uh, images I found on the internet is basically a sort of uh, an integration of 18th century enlightenment theory uh, with about equality and order with 19th century societal evolutionary uh, theory. It proposes uh, a well-known settlement evolution which goes from a landscape of small villages to your right number, number one uh, which is associated with segmentary societies to tribal chiefs some dome societies characterized by fortified centers to finally a landscape of cities and regularly divided and intensively settled rural hinterlands. And this last image, of course, uh, is the ideal landscape uh, which is connected with the so-called city-state societies, which for long have been considered the most sophisticated and as a consequent most powerful form of social political organization. And with regard to these three evolutionary stages, depicted on the slide, Roman coloni colonial influence in Italy has especially been recognized in the transformation for situation two to situation three. So keep these images uh, in your mind. Well, now to attribute an important role to Rome in this transformation process implies within this framework that Rome would have been a crucial agent in stimulating societal evolution at large in Italy, a truly civilizing, or if you want, Romanizing force. Well, let's now return to the actually research areas I'm going to uh, describe for you today. As I've outlined before, uh, we, the project aims to test this conventional paradigm empirically in two case study region, which have, however, very different research histories. Uh, whereas the landscape of Isernia, again, uh, image shown uh, to, off to your left, has hardly been investigated at all. The territory of Venosa is arguably the best investigated colonial territory, mid-Republican colonial territory in Italy. Uh, in the late 80s and early 90s, uh, a large-scale survey project has been undertaken there in the context of the well-known Forma Italia um, project, survey project and has mapped an incredible area of 400 square kilometer, uh, which resulted in the discovery of more than 2,000 sites, which have all been published um, by now. Well, it is impossible to discuss in this lecture all our preliminary re results, so I have decided to focus especially on the Venosa region today, since Tessa Steck has presented already in the United States a couple, uh, in a couple of papers uh, our preliminary data from the Isernia survey. What's interesting about the Venosa survey is that the data as it has been published actually strongly supports the conventional model uh, I just described. And the research shows that a pre-Roman landscape, which was characterized by a network of nucleated settlement villages uh, around which some uh, farms gravitate, and that's the upper right image for you, transforms radically after the Roman colonization into a landscape dotted with regularly spaced isolated farmsteads. Uh, the image here uh, on the bottom of the page. Moreover, an earlier scholar already discovered uh, traces of an early colonial land division system. Uh, as such, one could consider 
this area a classical example of a landscape that progressed from stage two, upper image, to stage three on the evolutionary ladder. Uh, and this was the result of Roman colonization. Uh, although it's clear that the Venosa territory changed fundamentally in the course of the Roman period, we, Tessa and I, were less convinced by the proposed pace and nature of these developments, and especially uh, about the important role attributed to the Roman colonization as a, a sort of catalyst of this process. Therefore, and, mo and most notably, in, in close collaboration with Maria Luisa Marchi, the original surveyor of this area, who is a very open-minded person, we, design, we designed a research strategy which would allow us to test this paradigm critically, focusing especially on uh, the fate of the nucleated settlements. Of the 20 nucleated sites dating to the Hellenistic period, ma mapped by Marki as part of this uh, Aga Venusinus survey, for a variety of reasons, mostly connected to accessibility and visibility problems, we could only study 11 uh, villages. And th those are the dots uh, on the map in blue. And for time reasons, in this paper, I will focus especially on one key site, and that is the Alan Prezer site. You can see it uh, circled in, in a red dotted line, uh, which is located about 10 kilometers uh, to the southwest of the colonial urban center of Venusia. Uh, our main aim was to retrieve high resolution data that permits a better understanding of the precise chronology and the changing morphology of nucleated settlement in the late 4th to 2nd centuries BC. For the region and time period under consideration, the most important type of material culture which allows for, aspired, for, the, for this aspired chronological resolution and which is present in significant quantities on the selected site is without doubt uh, black gloss pottery. D uh, during the first phase of the research, we therefore decided, in light also of the available excellent previous survey data on the extension and general character of the site by Maria Luisa Marchi, we decided to only collect black gloss pottery during the resurvey of uh, the sites. All nucleated site, sites were first surveyed using a systematic line walking strategy with 10 meter intervals between field walkers. And the precise position of every single black lot, black loss shirt was uh, recorded using a top cone DGPS in order to be able to reconstruct their spatial distribution. And in the second phase, all fields were resurveyed in a more random matter, manner with the aim to collect as many uh, possible black loss, black loss shirts. Of course, focusing on one class of material culture to reconstruct settlement dynamics has, of, has its methodological pitfalls. And everyone, every time I discuss this research, uh, the discussion will focus on this methodological issue. And I'm, I'm very happy to discuss this also uh, with you in the discussion. But in the remaining of my paper, and I hope you allow me to, I, I will focus on the results uh, of this research. Yeah, if we look, for example, at this Alan Preza site, uh, Alan Preza site I uh, outlined before, our research method resulted in a collection of 494 black gloss pottery shards spread out over most of the 19 hectares survey area. Uh, so 90 hectares, so we are talking about relatively large uh, sites. Uh, they are not very, very small sites, and 19 hectares is quite, quite a considerable uh, habitation area. And the overall distribution pattern matches rather well the initial uh, interpretation of Marquis that we are dealing here with a nucleated settlement of considerable size, uh, which consisted of several habitation cores. Although our research thus confirms the presence of a large nucleated settlement in the Alan Preza area, the detailed study of the black gloss pottery shapes by Lucia Lecce, which you see uh, drawn here on this uh, beautiful image, provided important new insight, insights into the chronological development of this site during the Hellenistic period 
and into the issue of discontinuity of occupation of the site between the pre-colonial and colonial periods. While Markey's study suggested that the village site, like all other villages, village sites in the area, was abandoned immediately after the colonization, our research, the research survey actually demonstrated that the, that the site shows a considerable uh, uh, amount of activity after the colonization of the area. I've tried to uh, highlight the, the moment of colonization in, uh, in this graph with this, uh, this dotted line over, over here. Uh, about 40 to 50 percent of all the black gloss pottery we collected on the site dates to the post-colonial uh, phase of the site. Uh, again, you see, here, you see on this map two different uh, graphs, which is the result of different dating techniques, and uh, we uh, decided to use various chronologies. The traditional chron chronology is based on the famous morale studies, but also new chronologies based on, on regional uh, uh, studies. And again, I'm not going into this uh, complex debate, uh, and perhaps I don't have to, because the most um, important conclusion is that all the, the, the different dating strategies we use uh, eventually point out to the same dynamics. Eh? We have a very considerable uh, proportion of the black gloss si uh, shirts on these sites date to the period after the colonization of uh, this area. The different types of analyses do, however, suggest different periods of steep decline of the black gloss pottery consumption. Uh, while Morel's chronologies, those are the blue dotted lines on this graph, uh, suggest this occurred in the first quarter of the third century BC, this precisely at the time of the foundation of the colony, the new cr uh, chronologies actually suggest a less marked drop, those are the, is the red line on, your, on the graph, uh, a less marked uh, drop, which also starts a generation later, uh, in the period 275-250 BC. This difference, however, is less important to our discussion than it might seem. As the, as the marked decline in black loss consumption in the 3rd century is not at all specific to the Alan Preza site, but reflects overall patterns of black gloss consumption and production in the wider region. And this is a phenomen phenomenon exposed clearly by Helga Di Giuseppe, uh, which she convincingly connects with the changing pottery demands and supplies in the whole of Italy. And so again, you see here the blue dotted line, which gives you black gloss consumption patterns in the, in the whole of Italy. Uh, and the red line is uh, the patterns expressed in percentages, of course, of the black gloss shirts we found on the uh, Alan Preza site. The implication of her study is that the drop of uh, black gloss consumption in the third century is not necessarily indicative uh, of, a of a corresponding decrease of human activity on the site. And the fact that in respect to the Italian mean, a significant higher percentage of the Alan Perez black gloss pottery has a chronology in between 275 uh, and 200 BC is significant and uh, attentively suggests that the community living on the site is actually, uh, actually thrived in this period. Uh, so you can see that for the third century, and that is the crucial period, of course, to our research, our line, the red line, is constantly above Italian mean consumption patterns. It's also telling that the spatial distribution pattern of black gloss pottery datable to the later 3rd and 2nd centuries, and those are the two images here on, uh, to your right, is actually quite comparable to the distribution pattern in the pre-colonial period. There's this image over here. Well, such a pattern, I think, uh, fits more comfortable with a scenario of relative settlement continuity than with a model of abandonment of the pre-Roman village uh, related to the radical reorganization of settlement in this area as a result of the colonial foundation in the area. Uh, and nevertheless, it is very hard, based on, on this data alone, 
to entirely exclude the possibility that the post-colonial, uh, very different meaning to that word in this context, uh, to these post-colonial black gloss forms on the site, um, are connected with forms of settlement uh, that comply to the conventional colonial model. Uh, in other words, we cannot really establish whether the uh, black gloss shirts we find are the result of a settlement pattern which uh, fits the nucleated model and the image uh, on the top, or is actually the result of uh, a settlement uh, organization which, which would fit uh, uh, the conventional model. Uh, there's uh, uh, a settlement of equally, uh, uh, e equally distributed colonial farmstead on the same uh, area. Therefore, in the second phase of the research, we focused on the areas of the regularly spaced colonial farmlands, uh, identified again by Markey. All the red dots on this map represent colonial, uh, Republican colonial farmsteads. The idea was that uh, this uh, resurvey would allow us to establish what the black gloss footprint of a colonial Republican farm is. Uh, so how much black gloss would, would such a site uh, produce. And this data then uh, we could compare to the village site. Here in yellow you see the areas uh, we uh, resurveyed. Again, I must be very brief. I will show you the result of one uh, region only, but uh, you must trust me that uh, for the other region the data is more or less uh, the same. And what was very surprising to us is the extremely low quantities of black pottery uh, we encountered in these uh, so-called very densely populated uh, uh, Republican farmlands. For example, in this area uh, where the market survey identified 10 Republican colonial farms, we collected only three black loss shirts uh, and could relocate, relocate only half of the sites Markey has mapped. So uh, you see here situation mapped by Markey in the 90s, and this is a situation uh, we encountered. Now, on average, uh, the farm black gloss shirt ratio is one to maximum two black gloss shirts per farm over the whole research area. And the densities of uh, uh, black gloss, here I have, a, uh, I have a graph, and the density of black gloss in villages is on average, and if we express this in densities per hectares, 30 times denser than uh, the amount of uh, black loss we find in these farmland areas. And so the graph gives you the, the, dense, the, the, the less dense areas in farmland area compared to the same, uh, the less dense black loss areas in village landscapes set out against each other. And you can clearly see the enormous difference in, in black loss density measured again per hectares in black loss area in village areas and in farmland areas. Well, this is surely significant for our understanding of population densities, for example. Um, but the most interesting result was acquired after we had studied the chronology of the black gloss pottery collected in these farmlands. Regrettably, as a result of these very uh, uh, low numbers of black lots uh, shirts we found, uh, we were only able to date 30 pieces of black gloss uh, with the necessary chronological precision. Those 30 pieces, although very, uh, surely not statistically significant, display a very interesting chronology. And the red line on the bottom gives you uh, uh, the chronology uh, of this of these shirt uh, and is set out against the, the blue line which represents again the chronology of black loss consumption in village sites. And what you can clearly say, see is that black loss consumption of both village and farm areas peak in the pre-colonial period. Uh, again, the dotted uh, red line gives you the moment of colonization and we see uh, black loss consumption in both areas actually peak in the pre-colonial period. And that's very different from what one has 
to expect based on the conventional settlement paradigm, eh, which predicts a decrease of villages and this is replaced by a steep increase of activities in these farmlands areas. I've tried to, to, to draw the expectant consumption patterns of the, of, the, of the conventional model in this graph below and compare that with our data. So this is obviously a very different dynamic than one, what should, uh, than one should expect based on the conventional model. Interestingly, the expected pattern is more or less recorded, but only uh, a century later, uh, in the second century, uh, when a new wave of colonists arrived in the Venosa area. So, I hope you're following, following me, and please interrupt if, if it's unclear. Uh, what you can see is that the, the pattern you expected, an increase of consumption in farmland areas and a decrease in village areas, is recorded, but we are now already in the second century BC and not in the third century when the area was first colonized. So that is, I think, uh, relevant. Of course, uh, more research is certainly necessary and is also scheduled, especially to collect more black loss shirts in these farmlands uh, areas. But if we return to our evolutionary scheme, we can conclude for now, uh, at least I hope, that the preliminary results of our research sits very uneasy with the dynamics predicted uh, by uh, this paradigm, uh, especially concerning the chronology of this change and the force that would have triggered it. The impact of Roman colonization on either the abandonment of nucleated sites or the formation of regularly spaced and densely settled farm landscape could not be confirmed by our research. Rather, we see a more gradual transformation of the landscape, which is characterized by expansion of rural settlement starting from the late 4th century BC, uh, which continues throughout the early colonial phase and reaches its peak only in the late Republican period. It's only in this period that several of the nucleated settlements seem to terminate. And these settlement dynamics are not at all typical for Venosa, but correspond very closely to those recorded in other non-colonized areas in the wider region. Mm. There's only one very important element of this stage three landscape remaining, which I have not yet discussed which I will try to do in, in, in don't worry, a couple of uh, minutes, the last minutes of this paper. And that is, of course, the land division uh, grid we see depicted. Uh, these beautiful lands that divide the, uh, the number three landscape. Arguably, these land division lines are the most important and powerful elements of, conventional, of the conventional colonial model. More than anything else, they reveal the complex organizational skills of the colon colonizing power and express in themselves the earlier discussed values of egalitarianism, geometric order, and intensive agriculture. In the last minutes, I would like to review this evidence, uh, and especially for their supposed early colonial origin. Early colonial land division grids uh, have been recognized in almost all mid-Republican colonies uh, in Central and Southern Italy, especially by a French team on the direction of uh, Chouquet. It's a very well-known research. You can uh, detect early colonial land division grids by their morphology, or at least that's a theory. And while the later Roman colonial land division program was characterized by orthogonal land division system and a very well-known centuriation. The earlier mid-republican land division systems are characterized by parallel main axes only. Well, such a grid has also been recognized in the territory of Venosa by Coppa in the, la in the, the late 70s. Marked here on this rather difficult to read map, uh, and they apparently cover enormous area of more than 400 square kilometers. So, 
try to realize the impact of uh, such a land division program in the early 3rd century in BC. According to his description, the lines have a mostly north-south orientation and are spaced at a distance of 200 to 210 meters from each other. Our analysis of the aerial photographs and cadastral maps indeed confirms such line exists in the territory of Venosa. So that's not something we have to debate on. Coppa, however, does not really provide any real evidence for the supposed early colonial date. Uh, but the fact uh, that it has the required morphology, uh, so these parallel lines only, and since the line spacing of almost 210 meters corresponds more or less with the Roman measurement unit of six actus, uh, are probably the most important arguments uh, for, his, uh, for, for this dating. It's indeed true, although not part of Coppa's argumentation, that similarly spaced grids have also been recognized in the nearby colonies of Luceria and, yes, Isernia. Uh, at first sight, this seems a very strong argument in favor of an uh, early Roman colonial date. There is, however, uh, another grid known in the region, and this is the one portrayed here below, which is located in the Greek colony of Metaponton, and that's not a Roman colonial landscape, or at least not in this period. In this area, two land divisions grids have been recognized, one of which, the most important, has a spacing of 200 to 210 meters. In this case, however, the distance is interpreted as reflecting an Attic platron. The, the same distance, it can be either six actus or seven Attic platron. Moreover, excavations showed rather convincingly, actually, that the division lines have been created in the first half of the 5th uh, century BC and others much older. They are, thus not, they are thus not directly connected to any colonization program. I made a point, um, as you probably all know, was founded uh, much earlier, in the 8th century. Moreover, these excavations also show that this line predominantly consists of ditches which functioned, which functioned to drain the coastal plain. And the date is significant as it corresponds with the recorded intensification of rural settlement in this period, uh, which, it seems, was made possible by regulating the com complex hydrology of this plain by means of this large-scale land uh, reclamation project. Uh, based on this analogy, one could start to question whether we should accept so easily a Roman origin for the Venosa grid. Uh, we already saw that rural settlement intensification and expansion into the lower area in the Venosa area uh, started well before the Roman colonization of the area in the 4th century BC. The only reason, I think, to exclude a pre-Roman date for the Venosa grid or any of the other proposed early colonial land division grids, which I have mapped on this map and which I will not discuss in any detail, uh, but they, most of them are actually not, uh, actually did not use the uh, Roman measurement system, the actus, those are the stars, but used platron or even italic measurement system, but are nevertheless usually attributed to Roman colonial uh, interventions. Uh, but the only reason to exclude uh, this pre-Roman date for Venosa uh, would be grounded in the earlier discussed evolutionary theory, which postulates that the native populations would not have reached the level of complexity yet that is necessary for the construction of such system. However, and I hope this is not disappointing to you, uh, the strongest evidence for dating the Venosa land division system is not from antiquity at all. Uh, but dates to the 19th century AD. Uh, the area identified by Coppa as part of the early Roman land division grid, I've marked that here with this red square, was actually a thick forest until the late mid 19th century. It was cleared in the 1870s and transformed into arable land for the poor by dividing the land in equally sized plots. Uh, the cadastral map is shown uh, below. Uh, and the main lines of this land division uh, system are actually spaced 200 to 210 meters uh, between uh, lines. Uh, considering this evidence, I think it would be very unwise 
to connect the discovered uh, uh, field division systems any longer to a Roman land division program. Now, of course, this example does not disprove the existence of any early colonial land division program in uh, uh, Venosa. And one could, for example, continue to argue that it existed, but the traces disappeared over time. But what this example uh, does show, I think, uh, is the risk involved when empirical evidence like this is approached uncritically to fit already accepted conceptual models. To sum up, uh, I hope to have demonstrated uh, that previous research, despite all its merits, has given the false impression of a match between field archaeological data and the expectations set out in the conventional models on Roman colonial landscape organization and its impact. And once the data are analyzed more carefully, the match turns out, turns out to be misleading. Our preliminary research strongly suggests that there is no correlation between Roman colonization and changes in it Italian agricultural practices, settlement preferences or connected stages of societal evolution. Of course, it is clear that the role and impact of Rome increased significantly in the late 3rd and 2nd century. And what it would be very difficult to deny Roman influence in the drastic reorganization of the Pole Plain, for example, uh, or Italy as a whole. This, however, would be in another paper. What is significant, however, about the conclusion that Rome was not yet this dominant force in the 3rd and 4th century BC is uh, that this implies that we cannot consider the discussed societal model based on order and equality has anything to do, uh, has, has been, can be uh, uh, an important explanation of the Roman imperial success in Italy. Uh, if we again abandoned, abandoned the edifix of regularly ordered colonial landscape, I think we can start recognizing very different patterns of colonial settlement organization in our data. And I leave it up to you to decide for yourself to which type of new world colonial landscape the archaeological data uh, presented on the green map of mid-Republican Roman colonies fits best. Uh, that of Savannah, Georgia, of that of New Amsterdam. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for an interesting talk with lots of uh, methodological elements and also a lot of archaeological data uh, to bring with. And I think um, at the very least you have indeed sort of shown that uh, we're looking at a much more sort of variable situation with lots more sort of options for uh, uh, well discussion and different kinds of interpretations. And because of all the uh, methodological but also sort of more specific elements that you were touching on, historical and archaeological, um, I would assume there are some questions here or there. In New England, the farmers used to mark off the boundaries of the land with stone walls. Had it, did, was there any markation that you know, the farmers used to mark off their property and where you were? Had you know, surveying? Well, nothing has been found uh, to prove this. So uh, there are, of course, descriptions in the Agrimen Zores and in the later sources which describe these practices. But then we are already in a very different period in, in, in Roman history. There's no evidence whatsoever for these kinds of practices in mid-Republican uh, colonial landscape thus far. It doesn't mean that there is none, but uh, no, there's none. Thing. And I'm fascinated by the, the, this, this case study and you know your your, your bravery in challenging the, the kind of established theories on Roman colonization um, in the Italian Peninsula. And I, I really do want to ask about methodologies, but I'm not. I'm going to. No, 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 no. <laughs> I'll leave it, <laughs> leave it for others who, are, who know more about um, black lost pottery than I do. <laughs> I know nothing. Um, so, but my question is also coming out of uh, some level of ignorance. When we think about the, the village sites versus the farmstead sites, are we talking about different cultural or social groups that might be inhabiting them? Or would they have been essentially the same populations just in different organizations on the landscape? 
or are those farmstead sites, that is colonization, that is actually bringing other groups into um, these territories that were inhabited by you know, indigenous groups or other earlier colonial groups? Well, according to the conventional theory, uh, the colonial farmers were migrants from central Italy in any case, and they lived in these isolated and regularly spaced colonial farms, while the native population would have lived in these villages, but the villages which were part of the, colon the new colonial territory, according to, to this theory, were abandoned. And the remaining indigenous population was moved to the, to the margins of the colonial area, and there they would continue, as this, uh, this image I showed you, uh, for a while in their uh, uh, somewhat primitive village-type settlement organization. And after a while, they, they, they copied the Roman uh, way of uh, living and they were started to also uh, live in these uh, farmlands. And that's the, the conventional story. If you would ask me who is living in these settlements, uh, I couldn't, couldn't give, give you any answer. There's no way, at least I think, to establish based on the pottery who is living where. What we can, uh, what we can however, uh, verify is that these settlements are not abandoned at all, or at least there is uh, and continuity of black loss consumption, and uh, let's be precise here, uh, on these areas. Uh, and the distribution of this pattern, to me at least, suggests uh, that there is a continuity of these very large village sites. And if you also uh, compare the quantities, so although there is a drop of black loss consumption on these village sites, we are still talking about 100 black loss shirts on one village, while in an area of uh, one square kilometer where a lot of colonial farms, farmers would have lived, and you only have two sheds. So there's an extreme difference in consumption patterns in these landscaped areas, which to me seems very hard to reconcile with any, any model which suggests a decrease of villages and an enormous population explosion in these rural farmland areas. Um, well, that was part of my question as well, as to um, uh, what could you say about the populations using these areas? and uh, listening to your answer, I'm, I'm thinking that um, maybe one of the things is um, not so much can we really get into are they Romans, are they non-Romans, pre-Romans or whatever, but are they buying into the same kind of economic system or using the same, using the landscape in a similar way or can you say something more about that as to... Well, it, the problem is they, so you don't know who they is, at least not from the archaeological context. What you, what you can say is that the black loss uh, ceramics that we find are um, for 95% local black loss okay. production forms. So there's, n there's no import of Campanian or typical late, late seal uh, black loss forms in our research area. And there's an area where, according to the sources, 20,000 colonists should have arrived. Well, that's it's a long discussion, and most people accept 6,000, but even then, uh, uh, that is a quite a considerable population. We, we, don't, we don't see any significant cultural change uh, in the black loss pottery. So I'm only talking about this because we didn't collect the other ones. If I know from other regions and later colonial areas, more to the north of, of uh, nor nor northern part of Italy, there you have uh, a very different pattern. There you see, really see Campanian and Latial type of black loss forms appearing in landscape which have very different traditions. But then we are again in the second century BC situation, which from a it's a military or historical perspective. It's a very, already a very different uh, period in Roman, in Roman history. So? Yeah, um, well, thank you, first of all. And, um, I'm very much convinced by the idea of your characterization of this as a more gradual and perhaps even delayed um, changes in, in rural um, settlement pattern. Um, and but as you were building the argument, you talked about, um, particularly with the black gloss graphs, um, this issue of continuity between pre and post colonization, um, and talked about this uh, moment of colonization. And I sort of wondered if you could elaborate that, because with your conclusion of a more gradual um, change, this, this moment of colonization gives a rather sad impression. Um, and I wonder if you're um, I deem that more from sort of Rome conferring a nominal status and the historical sources and sort of then how we reconcile these archaeological and historical views. Yeah. Okay, when I talk about this moment, I talk uh, about uh, and the, m the moment when, according to the literary sources, the colony was founded. And then what I try to do in this research is just see if 
this historical moment has any impact on our data. That's, that's how I use the term moment. According to the sources and the interpretation of the sources, because the sources are uh, open for very different ways of in interpreting them, but in any case, uh, the interpretation, the usual interpretation is that at that moment, 6,000 uh, colonists from Rome went in a nice line uh, and arrived in this area where, of course, there was first war, a lot of people died, people uh, were pushed to, to other areas, and they took over and basically built uh, their own community in this area. So uh, there were uh, traditional uh, models envisage this radical transformation of, uh, of people uh, living in this area. Well, I cannot exclude this, and I don't even want to be. I'm not, not that critical, actually, about the historical sources. The only point is, uh, I don't see, it, even if 6,000 people arrived, and I have no, no, no way of knowing this, uh, this arrival did not affect the organization, uh, the settlement organization at large, in a very fundamental manner. So these people, more or less, lived in the same way, had similar habitation preferences as the people living there before. It's possible that it's the same people living there, it's same communities. But again, then you end up in this ethnicity argument for which I have no real data to, to give you any, any conclusions. But what is significant in itself, I think, is that there is no radical transformation in, in the landscape, notable. And it's, it starts uh, 100, year late, 100 years later when there is a second wave of colonization. So when so you talk about colonization and, uh, as, as a moment uh, uh, as opposed to longer uh, waves of colonization, yeah, also in the, in the Finoza case, there is a literary record which suggests that a new wave of colonists arrived there in the second century uh, BC. And then we see some, at least some uh, changes in the pattern between the colonial area and the areas around it. So. I wonder if then you could push that as a use for exploring the rhetoric importance, perhaps, then. The rhetoric of? The importance of the rhetoric. You know, if you're not seeing the change in the ground, you don't have to, be, as you said, you don't challenge that if it happened or not, but maybe then it's part of a larger strategy. Of, of Rome? Or mm -hmm. Well, my, my point is more that I, I don't think Rome was any different from all the italic communities living in Italy. That's not a very new point, actually. But uh, so uh, uh, while and in a lot of studies, we assume these very marked differences between Roman organization and Italic organiza uh, types of organization, uh, actually what this research shows, and many other research has shown, uh, this is probably a very false understanding of the actual, actual situation. Rome, in terms of societal organization, in terms of settlement organization, was truly an italic community. So there's no real reason to expect any sort of differences which could explain the Roman imperial success, because that's the whole, the whole question behind the, this type of research. Uh, there's no reason to attach, to, to, to start looking for an, an explanation for this, this success in settlement organization or societal organization at large, at least not in the way uh, we see it reflected in the archaeological record. So that, that doesn't mean, uh, at the end, Rome was, of course, the, the, st the successful imperial power. So perhaps it was luck or there was another, another reason. But the whole point is that this 19th, 18th century idea that an important part of the success story was grounded or was rooted in this very remarkable way of organizing its society, which was more successful and therefore more powerful, well, this paradigm. Yeah, we could at least not verify it in our in our research. I wonder uh, if you think there might be a parallel in the um, economic sort of this, this following up on this economic line in the coinage too. In that, in the third century, you have Rome trying to fit in with uh, coinage that fits sort of by weight standard and by metal standard, like the Quadrigatus and the Victoriatus in that region, and then that moment you pointed to in the second century, you have, uh, and Rome really getting its hands dirty, right, yeah. the denarius becomes super popular there. Yeah. So perhaps what we have is a changing way, I, I mean, which is what you suggested, that Rome deals with these issues. And um, well, yeah, there's a very good uh, PhD uh, uh, 
almost finished now uh, by my late time here who actually studies uh, the coinage. And yeah, you have the same thing. So the, the, the weight standards of, of these colonies adapt to all kinds of local standards. And it's a total messy situation. Um, uh, so there again, you don't see some sort of standardization of formal approach of Rome, uh, which, uh, which gives this, this Roman identity to, this, to these landscapes, very varied landscape. And in the second century, indeed, as you said, that this changed fundamentally. So that, that's, that's more or less uh, uh, compatible with what we see here. Uh, but the main point remains uh, uh, that in the second century, Rome already uh, had uh, achieved the, its military uh, success. So all so the, the fact that, that it was this organized society in the second century is not an explanation for its success in the fourth and third. So uh, if, we, if we would like to stick on this traditional question of uh, Roman imperial success. You have one final question. Sorry, yeah, this is a very historic, historical question. Well, I'm wondering then if we, if we should think about changing um, ideologies or approaches to colonization then if we see a sort of second century horizon that maybe what the Romans are trying to achieve in the colonization practices, if we can even say that, in the third century are different from what they're trying to do in the second century. And this comes right off of what you just said. In the third century, because you know we, we talk about why are the Romans colonizing? Is it Romanization? Is it military strategy, right? As if it were a single thing mm. across time. But I think one of the things you're getting at is change across time. So maybe in the third century, it has a very different practical purpose yeah. from what we're seeing in the second century. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. So that that's one of the main uh, presumptions also of the project. That you should not use one monolithic understanding. Uh, and well, it perhaps seems evident, but there is a lot of research which still accept this model. Actually, so, so it's still a story I need to I need to tell because uh, you, you, you constantly see this this model being uh, repeated. Um, and, and but also, indeed, I, I try to envision uh, um, uh, Roman imperial uh, conquest in the first, uh, f uh, third and fourth century uh, BC, and they conquer an area, and then uh, within this, this model they were able to reorganize this whole landscape. All farmers lived there in isolated farm, while you have these just conquered uh, other people living all the way around. Also from a strategical point of view, it doesn't really seem a very logical landscape. It's a, it's a landscape that fits much better uh, in more um, quiet circumstances. It's a landscape which is often uh, uh, associated with intensive agriculture. If, if people uh, go and uh, uh, produce crops which need a very high labor intense intensity, then people are going to live on their fields and you get these, uh, uh, still using very general, uh, general theory. Uh, but then you would, in those kinds of contexts, you, you would more expect the genesis of, of these landscapes I, I, I just showed, but not in this very early imperial colonial context. And so. so dangerous, then. Yeah, it at least yeah. doesn't seem to. It, it really uh, supposes this extreme uh, superiority and dominance of Rome already in a period where it actually it doesn't seem that, that plausible yeah. to me. No black loss question. Great. No, no black loss question. <laughs> and on that note, we will have to do without black loss here as well. We just have plastic cups. But I would like to invite you to uh, to join us for uh, a glass of wine in a plastic cup uh, after we have thanked uh, Mia again for uh, this talk in which he combined uh, a lot of detailed high tech uh, field work that we uh, didn't sort of go into it, but that was visible, uh, sophisticated uh, landscape survey with. Uh, nuanced uh, interpretations of historical evidence. So uh, thank you for uh, this talk. Thank you.